I'd like to thank everyone for coming today and thank you to Tony and Shikar. I found that really informative. Um, now, when you're embarking on um, your ERP journey, one of the key things we understand, we all understand here, that ERP is the lifeblood of what we do. Uh, the functions that underpin ERP are crucial to our business. We know this and we're embarking on it for all the right reasons. An enterprise um, relationship for, uh, resource planning software can give you massive benefits. It can give you improved visibility on cash flow. It can give you uh, improved cost savings over supply chain, um, procurement, multiple areas. It gives you the opportunity to see much improved uh, business processes, better security, data management. There's a magnitude of reasons and there's huge amounts of benefit in doing ERP. But there's also an opportunity for risk and impact your business. Now that's not to say we shouldn't do it, we absolutely should. But when we do it, we've got to embrace the uniqueness of our organisation, and we are all unique, unique, to make sure that we get the maximum benefit, minimum impact. So for the next 20 minutes, what I just want to take you through today is some insights from Assurity Consulting. Um, we've been involved in some of the largest ERP implementations across Aotearoa, New Zealand. I just want to take you through some of the challenges um, consistent across these implementations. I want to talk to you about your risk tolerance and why that's important for you to understand. Then how testing can help you. It can help you build, de-risk and build confidence in your delivery. And then finally, well not finally, sorry, putting people at the heart and helping your people build resilience. And then a quick look at what good looks like across those implementations. So, starting across um, some of the challenges. Now, I've been involved in uh, multiple implementations. And it doesn't matter whether I'm brought in at the start to advise on the strategy, whether I'm brought in halfway through, remediation, uh, potentially looking at QA, or subsequently after to advise on go-life strategies. Um, these are consistent themes that come through from our consultants when we're engaging. Now, Meta Group have identified that only 20% of organisations understand the true cost of ownership of an ERP solution. That's 80% of people undertake this journey not understanding the magnitude of the continual investment in management, people, time, costs to maintain and upgrade their ERP solution. And that can influence decisions. Integration is a huge area of focus for organisations. You're buying a fully integrated software, but you also need to integrate your ERP with suppliers, uh, partners, banking systems, sometimes even your customers. And that is an area of unforeseen cost for your programs because quite often these are poorly documented, um, they're heritage systems, and you're reliant on other areas to support your program. So it drives cost and time. I just, Tony just mentioned data migration, but it is an area that it shouldn't be, but is consistently underestimated. It takes the same time, people, money, um, to invest in data migration, and quite often those people are scarce resources. They're quite often to, are required to do this at the very time that you're asking those people to do decisions on design, uh, make changes in the program, sometimes even build test cases. Um, so it's quite often a decision organisations make to push data migration out later. And then that causes unforeseen issues, it can raise issues later in the piece. The debate on customization versus configuration raises, and we go back to that uniqueness of your organization. Um, and when you couple that with a ingrained desire from your people to actually uh, maintain the status quo of your operations, quite often it drives a propensity towards customization. And in doing so, you can undermine the very reason for why you've taken an ERP solution, which is a fully working, constantly upgraded product. And the biggest example that I found of this and researched on was um, a SAP ERP implementation for Lidl. They're a massive market, supermarket chain in uh, Europe, billion dollar business. They embarked on SAP implementation. I know a couple of people here today are doing SAP. So no scare stories, but they undertook it. But right at the core of their problems was they decided, or their business was based on, recording items in their inventory at the price they pay for goods not at the price they sell them for at retail. And they weren't willing to change. 
And so they heavily customised SAP. And then they compounded multiple problems. But the outcome was canning the project, writing off half a billion euros, and not implementing. And finally, this is an area that I'm reasonably passionate about, is the impact on people. We are terrible in IT. We believe we're giving them a brand new shiny ERP system, and they'll love it, because it's going to make their lives easier, right? It doesn't quite work like that. And quite often, um, you've got to remember, if ERP is the lifeblood of your organization, well, people are the heart. And so you're asking them actually to step out of their comfort, which is the area they're experts in, and actually step into the world of IT. We're very bombastic IT people with a way of doing things, and you're actually putting them in a, in a high-stress environment. And it's an area that we have to be very, very mindful of. Sorry, gone the wrong way. Apologies. I told you, Cass, I shouldn't be allowed with technology. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so what can we do about it? Well, one of the key things I'll say to you is testing can help. But testing is like an insurance policy. Okay? It's an insurance policy. Okay, how much insurance is enough? Well, that's actually up to you. And it's dependent on a number of factors. Now, when I've engaged across ERP, I quite often come across personas in testing. And you get different types of insurance salesmen. And the first one you'll get is uh, not that common, which is a sensationalist. You've got to test everything. You've got to test this working product. Test everything or the world caves in. And typically, that is the uh, realm of cash-rich, uh, risk-averse organizations, uh, or body shopping consultancies. I'm just going to say that now. Um, or the next persona is probably the most common one that you find, which is the chef persona, as I call it. Now, they come in with a recipe. And typically, this is systems integrators, or it's the RP product, which is, hey, here's a recipe for your implementation or testing. Follow this recipe. This is the way that's going to give you great results, implement it really well for you. But it ignores what's really important to you. And quite often, um, organizations, when faced with that, they're taking advice, it's large ch scale change, they'll actually look to contract out their risk. They'll place contract clauses to try and mitigate that risk. Well, you can't contract out your risk. You're just trying to offset it with some financial, but it doesn't help you. As finally, there's the good insurance salesman, as I'd say, the one who sits down, who helps you understand what your tolerance for, for risk is, what's important to you. Uh, it helps you design uh, your risk tolerance. And at Surety, we do that through risk thinking workshops. We understand what's important to you, and that's really important. Because once you understand your tolerance for risk, you can actually start to make it widely accepted by the organization. You can start to build a picture of what's important to you both on an organization, people, customer, functional level. And then you can start to build a picture of your risk tolerance and make decisions about where you want to invest your um, mitigation in. And it's really quite simple. You find out what matters, and then you test what matters. Understand your risk profile. So now you've understood your risk. It all gets easy, right? <laughs> Very easy. <laughs> so. Once you've understood your risk, then you can start to look at how you're going to strategy. How are you going to build a test strategy to implement and mitigate that risk? Now, a, test, a strategy is just a set of plans and actions to achieve a long-term goal. Uh, but you own that strategy, that vision of the long-term goal. And that's not your SI, that's not your ELP product provider, it's not your testing partner. It's actually, you own it, they contribute. And we're very passionate about co-designing that with you. Because it's actually about understanding and placing your people at the heart of what you do. And this is where testing can help you mitigate some of those people challenges. Because we can start to place people at the heart of what you're doing. We start to build a picture of what's important to you. Now, early in my career, I was actually told to read a book called Getting to Yes. Uh, it's about negotiations, but it's actually really relevant for testing, which is focus on success. Don't focus on positions. Don't fo focus on contracts. Look at what's success. And that's an ethos that we believe in. If you focus on success, you can navigate really hard, complex decisions. It becomes your North Star. And when you embed your people in defining that success and making them feel valued, you give them a platform. Moreover, it actually promotes that collaboration and inclusiveness across your delivery teams. Because you've defined that North Star of what good looks like for you, 
you're actually making all of your delivery teams adhere to that, focus on that, deliver to that. Then you start to move away from the contract versus success conversations. You're just focused on what good looks like, not the contract of requirements that might have been specified by someone different three months earlier, or even the contract between you and your delivery partners, but what good looks like for you. And when you've embedded those people, you're actually building their confidence. You're actually starting to build enduring confidence through your program. And it makes them feel valued, and it places them at the heart of what you do. So, however you're implementing an ERP, and it could be that you're doing a COTS implementation or a cloud implementation, your business SMEs will be part of that journey. Whether it's exclusive business SME testing or uh, part of a wider test strategy, they will be part of it. And it's really important that we're mindful of the impact to them. Um, I went on this journey um, at, at scale with the inland revenue with over 200 of them. But actually, it's twice as important when you're smaller me medium organizations because quite often you're pulling those people from the front line. You're pulling them from doing their day jobs as well as doing the um, testing or advising on the program. So it's really important you're mindful of what you do and how you set them up for success. And Inland Revenue, we had a COTS provider, American company, exclusive business testers, and it was exactly how I explained earlier. You're pulling them a fish out of water, saying be a professional, and they just didn't know how to plan testing, scope testing, execute on testing, articulate defects and risks, and it made them very unhappy. It actually drove stress into their jobs, and we were asked to put a wrap around them, and it's very much tailored to your organization when you do this, which is what's appropriate for you. For inland revenue, it is mind maps, test on pl plans on page, finding the right approach to make them feel empowered. And you're investing in those people. You're making them realize that you want to invest in them, and it's important for you that they're a success. And you're allowing them to bring their expertise to the forefront. You're giving them the tools for success. They understand what's in it for them, and that's really important. Because by investing in your people, they become part of the journey. They become empowered. And most importantly, it actually made them self-sufficient in testing. And that was really important for us as an organization to leave our customers in a better place. Our clients could then decide in the future that they want to continue with exclusive business me testing. Because they have that option, or do they want to partner with someone to provide a service, or do they want to take another option? But they're self-sufficient. They're in control of their destiny. So automation is an interesting one. I'm going to make this statement now. It's not for everyone. Um, automation, if you ask someone at Assurity about automation, I would hope the first answer will be, uh, what is it part of a wider IT strategy? Because it must be. Okay, automation to be a success needs to be part of a wider IT strategy, clear goals, as Tony mentioned, which is we know what we want to get from this and we know what we're going to achieve. Really, really important. Um, and quite often, and it is a genuine, I'm going to say it's now genuine coincidence, but I'm advising on three programs at the moment. One, uh, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development has decided to embrace automation from the outset. Another one has said we really, really want to do this, but we actually can't at this time. We can't afford the time, people, and investment to do this right now, but we're going to revisit that decision. And another has just simply said it's not for us, it's not part of our strategy longer term, we're going to take the pain going forwards. And that's, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that, it's appropriate for each one of those organisations, and we've ensured they've made that with their eyes wide open, they understand. Quite often, people will just play the return investment game, which is you compare the time to manually execute testing versus the time to um, build and then subsequently execute automation over time. And where's the payback? Well, I can tell you now, typically that's two to three years, and that depends on a number of factors, but how much do you apply a rating of cost to your people, the opportunity costs of not being able to do their day jobs. So there's a number of areas that you look at on return investment, but we also advocate taking a lens of what value in trust in change? So automation gives you trust in change, and it allows you to remove management overheads. Okay? It allows you to take out um, a lot of looking at quality gates, etc., because you can accept things really quickly. You're focusing on embracing or encouraging your development teams to make fast incremental changes and move to production. Amazon 
actually release thousands of times a day to production. And they do it because they have a high trust environment, high trust in their automation. And their development teams are able to do that because they've automated processes and tests to make sure that they're respecting um, the business outcomes in production. The Inland Revenue undertook um, an ERP, Oracle Cloud, implementation. And they asked us to advise on the strategy for them. And they had clear goals. They were very clear in what they wanted to achieve. We want to take every single patch in production. We want to maintain a low risk upgrade path, but we don't want the cost of manually testing. And it was a key goal, and that was a remit for us, help us design an automation strategy. Now, we're very passionate about building right fit automation. Um, automation that is focused on not testing the product you have, testing outcomes in it, but we tend to focus on automation at the border for a couple of reasons. It's the point of least change, the contract between you and your system. And you can verify data upstream and downstream. ERP is a tested product that's delivered to you. But whether or not it works in your environment is the challenge you need to get to. So investing on automation in the border enables you to focus on, um, does that new patch release work upstream, downstream? It's an area that gives us the highest amount of uh, return. And it's also the point of least change. So you have a lower uh, remediation cost in the future. But as I say, it's not for everyone. And it's something that you really must make a measured attempt to understand the value when you do it. So success, again, it's a little like um, the uniqueness of your organization. Everyone measures success differently. And a lot of um, ERP implementations that I've been involved in have focused on delivery to time and budget to get it live. Well, success is often measured so much more than this, and these are some of the key feedback and characteristics that we have for people where we've, or organizations where we've done retros and been involved. First off, they place people at the heart. Their voice of the people have been important from the outset. They've valued and they've set their people up for success. Moreover, they've created a culture of import, they're placing importance on people, encouraging them to raise issues, and in doing so, it's really interesting to see that quite often the feedback we find is that not only did they feel empowered to raise issues, but they innovated on solutions for them. So they felt empowered to make decisions. And following on to that was that they understood the cost to serve. So decisions that were made in project life were made for the total lifespan of ERP. And that's whether it was integration, investment in people, processes, automation. It was made with an all-of-life lens. They embraced integration early. They focused on how could they de-risk their delivery by, in some cases, stubs, in some cases taking a vanilla version of the product, but taking integration off the critical path, not looking to do end-to-end -to -end integration tests when you've got a fully configured system that possibly is sort of six months maybe after you've started design, but doing it as early as possible. Data migration was done early. And funnily enough, if you do data migration early, it's, it's interesting from a tester's point of view because you are, I uncover issues organically. Um, quite often, when you address those issues early, you get uh, data migration early, you get issues that probably come out after a few process runs, um, possibly by date-driven events. So by doing it early, they organically found issues during the life of implementation. And finally, it was pretty much a stoic um, focus on configuration over customization to make sure they realized the benefits of their ERP implementation, to make sure that they <coughs> minimized their risk in production um, and lowered the cost to serve it. So it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour through. I only had 20 minutes. Sorry, Cass, I've probably gone over. But um, if I could ask you to take one thing away from this, it's actually just embrace the uniqueness of your organization when you're on this journey, no matter where you are. Because if you embrace that uniqueness and you understand what's important to you, then you can make informed decisions about keeping the cost to serve low. Cool. Thank you, everyone.